the screen where it says women in big data. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, great. Um, thank you everybody for having me. Really excited to be here um, and appreciate that introduction as well. So just a, a, a brief introduction of who I am. So hi everybody. I'm Jessica Sarceda. Um, I graduated from Arizona State in 2017 um, in the TEM program. I now sit as a board member on that major. So a lot of that major is really the liaison between the engineering and the business school. Um, a lot through that of how I found my love for product development and product design. Um, I'm currently a product director at an AI software company based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, um, named Paradox. And I'll show you a little bit of what I do at Paradox towards the end, um, as well as a really brief product demo, just to show you kind of how we've evolved the product, where it's come along the time. Um, and I also manage several of our key products, um, as well as a lot of our enterprise engagements. Um, I worked on various startups throughout my time in college. Um, one was a telemedicine company called eVisit um, from my digital backpack, which was built for students. Um, and now today, I really just want to be a mentor to not only students, but people that are starting off in their career or females in technology um, that really want to evolve into the technology space um, and to really guide and become that mentor for them. So an agenda of what we'll talk about today, um, I'll kind of walk you through what is product management, um, what are some common product management roles, um, as well as other common product roles throughout any organization. Um, and I'm gonna take us also through a really cool exercise on how to begin thinking like a product person, um, how to build very user-centric and intuitive products. Um, and then I'll also end it with just some Q&A if you have any questions about um, what I do at Paradox, I'd also would love to learn about what you do, um, if there's anything that, you know, comes up in terms of product development or product process that you have a question on, um, feel free to also engage throughout the presentation. Um, Want to keep it very open and very communicative. So I'll start off the presentation. Um, I want you to think about a product that you love. So something that you use every day, that you use often, um, and kind of think through some of these questions. How does that product make you feel? How often do you use that product? Does this product bring you value? Do people in your friend group or your family also use this product? Um, how much was the product? What do you love about it? And then what do you dislike about it? Um, so some of these common questions are what we like to think about when we're developing and bringing about new products. So if you have that one product in mind, I also have just some examples here of really great products in the market um, that are extremely innovative that have really brought about product development um, and thinking about a user design experience, uh, whether that be Hydro Flask, which is um, reinventing the way that we drink or that we view a standard water bottle, um, or a quick a quip toothbrush uh, that's really reinventing the common toothbrush to make it um, extremely efficient to how we brush our teeth, but also looking very sleek and accommodates that user experience. Um, to Fenty Beauty, making sure that everybody feels comfortable in their skin color and who they are, and making sure that we can all have um, really great makeup regardless of the color of your skin. Um, going even into the nest, so thinking about um, reinventing the thermostat. So how beautifully it is designed, um, how accommodated it is to the user. It's a really great product that a lot of us now use and that we could have in our homes. So I want you to think of that product and what you have in mind and some of those questions of how it makes you feel, um, how often that you use it, and really what it's done to revolutionize the way you initially um, were doing something before that product. So now that in mind, well, great, you're already thinking like a product manager. Um, those are the questions that we're always thinking about when you are a PM. We want to build products that people love and genuinely enjoy using. Um, as humans, we remember the products that bring us value. They make us feel good. Um, whether you're a CEO, a student, an engineer, an investor, understanding the fundamentals of product development will essentially help you in every day of your life whether that's in your career, your role, in your household, understanding some of these key fundamentals of product development will really help you when you evolve to either developing a product, managing it, um, shipping it, marketing it, uh, really any sort of sector that you are in your business, understanding product development will really help you. 
Um, so here on the screen, I have one of my personal favorite products. Um, it's a Buffy comforter. Um, it's something that is really memorable to me. It helps me get a good night's rest. Um, it, I found it by um, scrolling through Facebook, so it was an advertisement to me. Um, love the product. I speak very highly of it. I have people in my family that now have this comforter. Um, and it's something that brings me a lot of joy uh, from the moment that I saw the advertisement to the packaging up until now using it for about a year. So I want us to kind of keep that in mind as we're going throughout the presentation today and having some of those products that we use every day or that we come across with and how we can implement some of these product development fundamentals when going through thinking about products. So overall in this workshop, um, I really want to help you better understand what does it take to ideate, build, and ship user-centric products. So really thinking about the user in mind here and how do we empathize with users before we go ahead and build out a product, um, whether that be software or a physical product, um, regardless to excuse me, regardless to of your age or your role, um, really understanding these fundamentals of product management can help assist you in, in really any way um, to kickstart your career, um, to enhance your career, to bring about new products um, to investors or to your C-suite, um, or even to really help you launch your next business idea. So my goal today is to show you just some common um, product development steps. We're also going to go through um, an engaging exercise together and how we can redesign the water bottle um, and some of the common theories and ways to go about that product design process. So overall, um, I'll begin it by just what is product management? So I'm not sure if here has ever heard of product management. You can give a, um, a hands up here if you have. I know it's it's more of a new role that's come about over the last 10 years. Um, I personally think it's a very, very exciting role to be in because it's the liaison between business, engineering, and the client. So typical traits of a product manager can be they're empathetic, so they feel with the user. Um, they can execute, so they're organized, they're eager, they, they're constantly wanting to learn. Um, they're curious, they're strategic thinkers, so they can think about a problem that we face every day as a human and trying to formulate a solution to it um, through their product or through the way that they market the product. They're also very design focused. So if you think about some of the common products that we use every day, um, like our iPhone or an Apple Watch um, or your laptop or Zoom, um, thinking about the design elements of it, of how it keeps us engaged, how it keeps us interacted, um, how user friendly our experiences are with those products keep your users coming back to use the product or to even spread the word to other people that they may know in their network. Um, a lot of product managers as well, they're very entrepreneurial. So they want to begin their own venture. They're constantly trying to solve or come up with a solution to a problem. Um, it's something that I remember as a young kid that I would do if I you know, was coming across a toy or came across an issue with um, the garage door, I was always trying to just figure out how can I fix this and how can I make it better. Um, so that's what I really do think is the beauty of, of product management of, and of being in and understanding product development is that you want to be able to fix and you want to be able to really solve a problem to help people around you. So this is just going over um, some of the key elements of product management um, that it really uh, ranges from leadership to data to being able to measure how your product's doing. Um, is it working well? What are ways that we can improve upon it? Um, even to communication. So how are you communicating your product um, internally to your team, to your sales team, to your marketing team, um, as well as externally? So how can we go off and sell this product um, how are we communicating it to our clients or even beyond um, to get more people to actually use the product line? Um, being able to prioritize, take action, and thinking about the user are also really key elements of product management and product development. And some of the key roles that we do see in, in product and various organizations, it can range from associate PMs, um, product managers, product owners. You could have product directors, which will oversee a group of PMs, designers, and engineers. 
Um, your VP of product is typically over your directors, um, which can kind of set a little bit more of the vision and the forecast of your organization. Um, chief product officer, we also have product designers on product teams as well. Um, that can range from UI UX designers um, up until, you know, if they really specialize in user experience or if they're more on that front end engagement of really thinking through the product design. Um, we essentially work with all of these different people in our product organization, but we also stay very close connected with the sales team, the marketing team um, and other roles in the business to make sure that we're building product that really makes sense to our clientele or to our future users. So what's really interesting with product and especially with product teams in general is that all product teams are different. Um, so whether you're at a startup or a big organization, um, the team can be ran in completely different ways um, across different size organizations. But what's great with that is that through some of the fundamentals and teachings that I'll show you in the upcoming slides is that you can use some of those design thinking elements and frameworks um, to really help you in your current role. But also if you were to go into a different role at a larger organization or even a startup, um, I, I do truly think that it's important to still keep on to your personality, personality and some of the teachings that you've kept from previous product development roles or product design roles and constantly evolve that as you grow personally or as you work with other people. So the overall product development process. Um, so I really want to walk us through just some fundamentals of what to think about, what questions to ask when you want to develop a new product line. And then towards the end, I'll actually have us go through um, an engaging exercise ourselves. So then that way you can use this in your future or in your everyday career to really help you think like a product manager. So this process here, um, it's a little bit lengthy. I have in the next slide just something that condenses it into um, a little bit more of a simpler framework. But overall, when you think about a product development process, um, you want to define the problem. So you want to define what problem am I solving by creating this software feature or this new software product um, or creating the next water bottle or the next thermostat. Um, what is that problem that I want to solve with it? And then what are the user pains? So being very empathetic to your user is one of the key goals of being a really great product manager. So really being able to step foot in what, what your users are feeling and um, what they're thinking and what they're really feeling throughout the entire problem issue and problem statement that you've defined in that number one step. Um, one of the great uh, processes that I've gone through when developing new products um, is writing out my user stories. So I'll, I'll take you through kind of what that looks like based off of that problem statement and understanding what's the goal of the user when you create this new feature or when you release this new product line, um, what do you want them to feel? What, do you, what are the needs? What are the wants? Um, being able to prioritize is also key in developing a new feature or a new product line. So what data do you have to back up why you wanna build this new product? Um, what are your clients saying or what's the key persona audience saying about um, the, the problem and the user pains that they're having? Um, Defining the MVP too is extremely important when you prioritize those user stories. So coming up with that most minimum viable product um, is extremely important. So that way it can get you focused on shipping your product versus perfecting it. Um, that's one of the key things in product is that you're going to constantly be iterating and iterating. Um, it's always good not to settle down with your product and not to feel fully content with whatever product that you own or that you're building. Um, sometimes as product people like to fall in love with our product or our design and it's just something that you have to throw out the door, um, you know, be really humbled about it that it's not perfect and it needs to constantly evolve um, and building that technical requirement as well. So I don't necessarily think that product people need to be engineers or need to learn how to code. Um, it is very valuable and it is something that really helps you in your everyday life as a product person. Um, but being able to communicate what you want that feature or product to do, how you want it to act um, to your engineering team can help make sure that it's user centric, but also developed in the right way. So I kind of created this way of how we think about the product development process 
into five different buckets. Um, so like I said, we have the problem, then we create the resolution, which is the user stories. Then we want to prioritize what are the what are the key elements that we really want to address um, with the solution to this problem. How are we going to build it? So is it technically feasible? Um, do my wireframes as a designer or um, as a PM owning the product, does it convey what I want it to do? Um, is it is it are the designs clear to my engineering team? Um, are they understanding what it takes to really build the product? And then lastly, constantly iterating. So looking at metrics, looking at data, what's not working, where are clients getting stuck in this product, um, whether that's software or a physical product, um, you can still kind of do like any sort of rating engagement of how people are interacting. Um, I know with software, we have a lot of rich data opportunities nowadays. Um, to even see where people are clicking in your product and are angry or they can't figure out what's happening. Um, so there's really great ways that you can figure out as a product person or as a product manager to iterate um, on your feature or on your overall product. So thinking through that, um, just kind of think, that, think of this in mind when we go through a couple of the exercises of what problem do you want to solve? How are you going to solve it? So what do those user stories look like? It? What do those user stories look like? And how should we prioritize those user stories? So what's the most important for the user to solve? Um, what does the level of effort look like versus the level of impact? Is it high level of effort and high impact or low effort, high impact? Um, kind of thinking that in mind when you're prioritizing is key. And then the whole building process. So how are we going to build this? Is it feasible? Um, is engineering aligned with what I want to build? And then after you ship the product, being able to constantly iterate. So like I said, you can't fall in love with your product or your design with how it is today because it's going to constantly evolve. You're going to constantly learn by your users, by your clients, um, by your prospects. And so being able to um, really allow yourself to iterate and, and convey that back to your team is key. So how do we create really beautiful user experiences? Um, there's this really great podcast called Masters of Scale, um, where we're talking to Brian Chesky, and he's the uh, he's a co-founder of Airbnb. Um, and throughout this podcast, he's talking about creating 10 star, 11 star products. Um, so he's essentially talking about how Airbnb, they were really trying to get traction in their beginning days. Um, they wanted to create a product that people just love to use. And one of the methodologies that he went about was this idea of creating a 10 star product. So if I'm not sure if you're familiar with Airbnb, but basically it allows you to um, essentially uh, stay in a, a condo or a home um, of some of a host and you can stay there almost like you were, you were to stay in a hotel. Um, so when they were trying to innovate and really iterate on their product, he came up with this 10 star experience. So he wants you, know, you to think about product development in the way of what's your ideal experience as a user, as somebody that will stay in an Airbnb. And he explained it by this quote that I'll read out. So he said, a 10 star check-in would be like the Beatles check-in. It's 1964, I'd get off the plane and there'd be 5,000 high school kids cheering my name, cars welcoming to my destination or to my country. Um, I'd get into the front yard of my host and there'd be a press conference waving for me. Um, the love and star experience is I show up to the airport. Um, maybe there's Elon Musk saying, hey, you're going to space. And so the whole point of creating this 10 star experience is that, yeah, it may seem far fetched. Um, it may be kind of that dream state, but it actually helps you influence and build really beautiful and user centric products. Um, and it's the feeling that you want to have when you show up to your Airbnb, you want to feel welcomed the second you get to this new city. Um, you want to feel like you're, you know, this is your new home for the next week or the next two weeks. Um, so it really helped with them when they were influencing and creating really great products. Um, and it's something that I always go back to when I'm creating a new product line or a new feature of what is that ideal experience and what would I want to happen based off of that 10 star, 11 star experience. And he has a good quote here saying, you have to almost design the extreme to come backwards. Um, so it's another thing too, when you're thinking about creating a new product line that if you can think of the extreme user experience, it can really help you to scale that down and scale backwards um, to think about actual feasible features and products that can help solve the problem that you're looking for.
So overall design thinking, um, the next exercise that we'll go through when beginning to think like a product person or think like a product manager, um, we wanna empathize with the user. So we wanna know exactly what frustrations, what pains is that user feeling, um, whether they are going to use this future product or whether how they're feeling with your current product. Um, how can we define then empathize back with that user? Being able to ideate while prototyping and going back to the user experience is also extremely important. Um, I feel like this map really helps kind of visualize the whole process because it is very iterative. You are going to jump around from testing to prototyping back to empathizing with the user um, up until your actual launch. And that's what's so important when thinking about a new product or thinking about building a new feature is being versatile, um, knowing that it's not going to be perfect and being humble in that, but also at the same time, really wanting to understand the user pains so that you know what you're building is truly solving a problem. All right, so how do we think like a product manager? Um, I really wanted to just do this exercise. I, I had a water bottle right next to me when I was creating this presentation. So it was one of the first objects that came to mind, but let's take the water bottle, for example. And through this exercise, I really want us to go through redesigning the water bottle um, through some of the techniques that we learned today. What are some of the problems that, we, that exist with the plastic water bottle and how can we really think about that 10 star experience um, when redesigning the water bottle? So this is going through and highlighting that product development process um, that I talked about earlier in the presentation um, and really this being specific to a water bottle. Um, so this is just thinking about, you know, how would we redesign an object like the water bottle and how would we take it through the entire product development process? Um, here we have the problem statement. So what's a problem with a plastic water bottle? It's not eco-friendly. Um, it affects many people. We all have to drink water. Um, it's not durable. It's not reusable. Um, it also takes up a lot of space. So usually when you buy a plastic water bottle, it comes in a case. Um, it's not that, you know, user friendly when I constantly have to carry it to my car if I purchase it um, or have it stored somewhere in my house. It also doesn't keep my water cool for a long period of time. If I'm on the go, if I want to go to the store, I want to go to the gym, um, that water bottle just isn't durable and isn't keeping what I need for it to be cool. Um, so going through the resolution stage of this, and I'll kind of break down each user's story and how I prioritized it a little bit further, but how you can see here for the resolution piece is that I break down user stories. Um, what's great with the user story is that it really lets you define a problem of the user and how that user is feeling. So for a couple examples, I say, as a user, I need the ability to bring the bottle with me when I'm out and about, when I'm on the go. Um, as the user, I need the ability to drink the water in an easy to use way. So I want it to be user friendly. I want it to be easy if I'm driving. Um, I want the bottle to keep my water cold. So that's also a key piece here is that I want water to stay cold as I have to keep it for five to 10 hours when I'm on the go or when I'm traveling or hiking. Um, and also having it just look nice is also a key element um, for myself as a user. And I'll, I'll kind of walk you through how I broke down some of those personas. Um, but it's good to have a water bottle that just looks nice with you if you're carrying it, if, you're, um, if you have it with you at work, um, you know, something that really makes you feel good and that is personable to what you want and what you see as a water bottle. Um, and also I think what would be really great as a user um, would be the ability to, to really see how much I'm drinking per day. So is it keeping me on track with my goals for health, making sure I'm getting my water intake um, and kind of mapping out those user stories will help you then define what persona do you wanna focus on? Um, is this for a young athlete? Is this for the elderly? Is this for children? Is this for a young adult that just wants to stay hydrated? Um, being able to map out those user stories can also really help you define the personas that you want to focus on. And then after you go through that resolution stage, it's important to prioritize. Um, so what are the key pieces that we really need to focus in on when coming up with the solution to the plastic water bottle? Um, it has to be reusable. It has to be insulated to keep the water cool. It has to be portable and look nice. 
And then a great nice to have would be, it gives me a reminder on my intake. So um, it's a really differentiator from what else could be out in the market um, and then can influence also how you build. So then going into that build stage here is gathering the specs on materials, understanding the pricing. Um, what does the production look like for this water bottle? Um, where will I produce it? How will I produce it? Um, and then when can we ultimately get an MVP out there? And then what's great with that is that you can constantly iterate on the product. So I know that this is just a, a consumer product. Um, thinking about the water bottle, it's a very just simple product to try to reimagine. I know a lot of people have already done this um, with some products that they've built, but it's also really important to think about too when you're creating software. Um, is kind of going through each one of these steps, understanding your user, prioritizing based off of some of those user pains, um, understanding the build requirements, the technical specs, um, how you actually want to build it and how you'll execute on that product, and then constantly making it an iterative process will help you whether it's a physical product or a software product. So with the water bottle, um, here I just kind of mapped out how I was thinking through when I was defining the problem. So this is the number one key goal when I want to create a new product, a new feature, um, or in this case, reinvent the water bottle. So here I mapped out that it's not eco-friendly. I mentioned this all in the previous slide as well, um, but just mapping out all of the various problem statements that I would like to solve is important to help you to begin thinking about those user statements and to begin prioritizing to lead you through um, the rest of the product development process. So this is when I started really thinking about the user story. So after you have those problem statements, now you can begin thinking about user stories of how can you solve those problems or how is the user feeling? Um, and that's when I started mapping out the difference between needs and likes. Um, I do that still even when I'm building software is that when I'm creating a new product, um, I want to really map out the user stories as what do I need to have versus what's a nice to have or what's it I would like to have um, when addressing some of those, those pain points of your users. So here I talk about needing the ability to bring the bottle with me. So making sure that it's versatile and durable, um, being able to have it um, fit well when I'm holding it or I'm on the go. So making sure that it has some sort of way that, that makes the water bottle easy to use and easy to carry for the user. Um, needing to keep my water cold, so making sure that it's insulated so I can take the water bottle with me wherever I go, um, whether that's two hours, three hours, or 30 minutes. Um, just really being that differentiator from plastic water bottles. And towards the um, end here, you can see that I start kind of highlighting user stories and the user stories could go on for much longer um, if I wanted to really break it down even further. Um, but it even goes to as a child. So um, as a user, I wanna keep my child safe from over drinking at one, at one time or um, throughout a period of time. So if I'm a parent and I'm designing this water bottle or this um, water for my child, how do I want that design to look and feel? Um, same for the elderly. If I wanted to design a water bottle for my grandmother, who cannot see, how would I be able to design that for her to be able to know where the water is, to be able to feel the water bottle and to be able to really be accustomed to who she is and who she is as that persona. Um, and that's what really gets into the product personas. So here for this example and, and redesigning the plastic water bottle, um, I focused in on just young adults. So young adults from 18 to 30 years old, um, versus going into the young athlete or the elderly or the children. Um, just really wanted to make a very targeted specific persona um, around the young adult that could be just a common person that needs to stay hydrated and drink water. And that's what I use to prioritize some of these key user stories to then go redesign the water bottle. So what's important when go now going through that prioritization stage is what else exists in the market? So doing that research is so important because it'll really help you understand what are those common water bottles out there in the market that are already insulated, that are nice to use, that look beautiful, 
Um, here in the top right corner, you can see I also included some of the water bottles with that user pane that I um, recognized in the previous slide of wanting to remind the user to drink water throughout the day to make sure that they're getting their daily intake. Um, but you can see a lot of those water bottles are very bulky, um, not insulated, um, isn't as durable to meet some of my other user pains. But I was able to do some of this market research, figure out pricing, see what materials people are using um, to really let that influence what product I want to develop and how I would redesign the plastic water bottle. Okay, so now we go into the benefits and the trade-offs. Um, this is another really key important piece when trying to think about what are the key user stories that I wanna focus on when I go in and actually build this redesigned water bottle? So one of the key um, priorities here, I kind of number them out to make sure that we can have a priority based off of those user stories that I mentioned. Um, number one is as a user, I wanna reuse the water bottle. So that's one of the key pains that you have with the plastic water bottle is that it's not reusable. Um, you can't take it with you for a long period of time without it getting crunchy or without um, the entire water bottle just not staying durable or reusable um, or to keep it through tomorrow or to the next week. Um, that was one of the key pain points that I really wanted to focus on. And then I go through and really prioritize all of the user stories based off of the persona. Um, so this is a key part in the product development process. When you're thinking about trade-offs and you're thinking about prioritization, it's so important to kind of go in and number. Um, that way you can see what's the most important to accomplish for your users, um, especially if you find that you can't accommodate one of the user pains, um, whether it's through financials or through strategy for your company. Um, being able to have it numbered and being able to have the priority set for your user stories and for your resolutions is really important. Um, that way it can make sure that you as a PM or you as a product owner can really champion um, for which resolutions or which user stories that you want that product to focus on. And then the ideation phase. So this is also what's really fun too is that you need to think about the materials and you think about the costs, about production, um, and all of this kind of is what influences the overall build. Um, so when you're going from that prioritization stage into the actual build of this, um, I didn't write out all of the production costs and material costs, but these are really good things to keep in mind, um, whether it's software or a physical product, is to understand the feasibility and the technical scope and specs of it. Um, how much engineering time is it going to take? So if it's a software product, how long would the MVP or would the, the key user stories I wanna focus on take to actually get to market. Um, for this case of it being redesigning the water bottle, how long would it take for us to get in a prototype, have it shipped, have it production ready, um, have the packaging ready and able to go to reach out to our users or to our prospects, um, and then being able to select those trade-offs. So since you had those user stories really prioritized and mapped out and and really addressing the key pains that you wanted to, um, being able to utilize that really helps you when thinking about the trade-offs. So what could you do without when shipping the water bottle or what can you really, what are must-haves and what are need-to-haves um, when designing your product? And so I actually, I picked a, a water bottle on the market that essentially addressed a majority of the user pains that I had highlighted. Um, and so if I were to go and, and redesign the water bottle and say this was my company and this was the ideal water bottle based off of um, the design method methodologies and the product methodologies that I highlighted, this is how I would envision it and what I would see it looking like. Um, it's very easy to use, easy to carry, it's insulated, it has that beautiful look and feel for what I wanted for that persona clientele. Um, it has the reminders too of when to drink your water to make sure that you're up to speed and you're up to par, that you're getting your health intake for water. Um, it really meets a lot of those user points and those pains that we addressed with the standard water bottle. Um, so that's just kind of like a fun exercise to do uh, really with any product or even if you're scrolling through Spotify or an application um, to take one of those features or to take that, um, that core product. So if it's 
it's a physical product and really go through that design process to think about what problem do I want to solve? What are those problem statements? Um, how do I want to solve it? So what are your user stories look like? Um, what are your user stories and your persona that you really want to focus in on? And then how do you want to prioritize that? What's the most important for your clientele or for um, your prospects or for the audience that you really want to target towards? What are the most important and key user stories that you want to convey and that you want to fix um, for that audience? And then going eventually into the build and the iteration process, um, what's the technical scope? What's, what are the specs to get that product across the finish line? And then constantly iterating on the product, whether it's a feature or a water bottle um, or a coffee mug or an iPhone, um, being able to see and to really be humble that it's not perfect and people still run into pains. Um, they're not fully content. Maybe somebody is, but how can we make the experience a 10 star, an 11 star experience um, for users and for people that are utilizing our products? So any questions um, just so far on kind of just product development, uh, I wanted to dive into kind of what I do at Paradox and a few of our products and what they look like. Um, but really just want to have a, a little recap here. I know I've been talking a bit. Um, if you have any questions just on product development, um, the product design process, developing user stories, um, anything, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to sure. chime Hi, in. Jessica. Uh, we one came in through the chat. What is a uh, ship S H I P? Yeah, good question. Um, so shipping product is essentially the launch. Um, and so when you ship a new product, it's when for software, when that product is available on production or on a live website. Um, if you ship a water bottle or a physical consumer product, it's when it's out in the market and people can purchase it. So the whole concept of shipping products for product development is just getting the product out there and getting it ready to market or in production if it's software. Great, thanks. Um, so please either enter questions in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. Feel free to do that as well. The group's yeah. not overwhelming at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah, and as anything else comes up too, I know I can't, I would navigate to look into the chat, but I have a couple of screens here going. Yeah, no, no, um, I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll definitely be doing that for you. Awesome. So, um, but nothing's come in through the chat yet. Um, so I'd say just continue on. Um, awesome. A great presentation so far. Thanks. <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, really that's going on with the product development process, um, how to rethink products. And I also kind of summarize this towards the end um, of what to do and how to think like a product manager in your everyday life of your, or of your everyday role. Um, but also wanted to spend some time in this presentation to kind of walk you through um, what we do at Paradox and what I do. Um, so I help lead a product uh, for conversational AI that helps lead people and their talent teams to do less with automating all kinds of everyday tasks. Um, so our product, which is Olivia, um, she's an assistive intelligent assistant that lives on multiple career sites um, to help somebody that's looking for a job to find a job that's best fit for them. Um, it's very user centric, like what I highlighted earlier in the presentation is that we always have to think about our users um, and empathizing with somebody that is looking for a job. Um, the pain points that they may have, they want it to be seamless. Um, they want it to be similar to them just, you know, being on their iPhone or talking with Alexa. Um, we want to make it all very user centric. And we've also learned too that the whole concept of assistive intelligence is every day and it, it's apparent in every day. Um, we see it in our cars, we see it in like what I showed you with Nest, with Amazon Alexa, um, with your Apple Watch, with your phone. Um, so since it's everywhere around us, why haven't we built a system intelligence into HR and into finding a new job or helping recruiters really cut back on that time that it takes for them to hire somebody? Um, so that's our whole position that what we've done with Paradox is that if we live in a world where assistive intelligence can do 
everything around us basically nowadays. Um, why are talent acquisition teams still spending all of their valuable time and resources on some of the administrative tasks? Um, and it's how we doubt our entire product at Paradox is that there's no simple way for candidates to engage quickly. Um, most applicants wait for days, for weeks, to really hear back from the employers that they're trying to apply for. Um, as a user, if I'm somebody that's looking for a new role, I wanna feed my family, I wanna pay off my bills, it's urgent that I get um, that confirmation or I get some feedback from the organization that I'm trying to apply to. So that's us really being user-centric and empathizing with the candidate to be in their foot, to be in their shoes, um, to really understand those pains, to make sure that Olivia and that our assistive intelligence AI is helping a candidate when going through this process, making it human-centric and human-friendly so that they have somebody to talk to, even if it's just an AI, but it's an assistive intelligence, human-centric chat that allows them to get the responses on the company, to have them check their status on their application, um, and to also help talent teams. Um, we find that so many recruiters are sitting there on computers, they're constantly sourcing, or they're trying to schedule um, interviews, and it's taking them so many hours and days at a time to do that. And so that's why we've built out Olivia, is to help really take off that burden um, from not only the candidate, but also from the talent acquisition teams. And so like I was saying too, um, and some of the ideas and suggestions that I highlighted earlier in the presentation is that data really helps you create and, and to prove some of your ideas or some of the user stories that you highlight. Um, so this was taken from one of the studies that was done on AI and conversational AI for recruiting and for the job search. And this just shows how much productivity and how many hours that um, talent acquisition teams and that recruiters spend without having conversational AI um, in their organizations versus what it looks like when having a conversational AI element like Olivia to help them complete their tasks, to help them schedule their interviews, um, to make sure that they're aware of who's starting on their first day, um, to even screen them. Olivia can screen a candidate within seconds to see if they're fit for the job or if they're eligible to work um, in a specific country. Um, she can do that all within seconds, where that would take uh, most recruiters hours or days to, to get all of that information. And we have really great clients too. Um, that's what's awesome with, with working for Paradox and with work um, at my company is that I'm constantly being able to work with tremendous clients in different industries. So I get to think about the user experience from um, a consumer product organization, um, all the way to McDonald's or Wendy's, um, being able to understand too that the candidate population can be different across these organizations also makes product development really rewarding and also challenging of how do you think about those user pains and keep those user pains um, in mind when you're coming up with your solutions to really make sure that it's addressing your clientele. And so I'll just show you a couple of the products here um, that I help work on and that I work with really tremendous um, product managers on. Um, and so when we take our job search product, um, really what we wanted to and the whole key problem that we wanted to solve was what if looking for a job didn't feel like a search? Um, so what if you could quickly go to whatever career site or text Olivia um, to quickly find a job that you're interested in and get qualified within seconds? And that's what really helped derive our whole conversational job search product was having that pain in mind and then coming up with the user stories of how do we wanna address that pain? Um, how do we wanna pick up if somebody's interesting in marketing versus engineering? Um, and then how can we make it all very conversational so that it's almost like I'm talking to a human, like I'm talking to a recruiter that's sitting next to me, asking me, what do I wanna do at a specific company? Um, so it's a really great product that we've really evolved across the time and across um, over the last couple of years to make sure it was very centric. And we also have our CAPS product, um, which is really great too. So this is also derived by the whole um, user experience and by really thinking about 
what's a pain that users can have today um, when they're trying to look for a role and when they're getting captured and when they're getting screened for a specific role. Um, and so this is just a quick kind of demo of what we do there in terms of SMS um, and engagement. Let me go into. And what's great too is that um, our entire product, it's available in 100 plus languages. Um, we accommodate on multiple messaging platforms, um, which is also really thinking of be about being user centric and keeping the user in mind that you can have somebody in the United States that may use um, just iMessage or text message um, versus somebody who's in India that may want to use WhatsApp. Uh, we've really built our product to accommodate to um, different people across the world globally. So my challenge for all of you um, after this presentation, and I'll, I'll kind of end it with the Q&A as well. I see that some chats are coming in, but I'm, I'm afraid to click on it because I don't want to ruin the presentation here. Um, but after giving you just a brief introduction of, of Paradox and what I do, I really want to circle it back and kind of get this reminder of the next time that you're in Target um, or you're, if you're in a grocery store, um, pick a product and try to figure out how you would redesign it. So in this use case, we did just a plastic water bottle, but it really could be anything. Think about how would you redesign a washing machine or a dishwasher? Um, what are the core problems that you see with it today? What user stories do you want to focus on and how would you prioritize it to create the ultimate 10, 11 star experience? Um, and that's kind of the whole goal with thinking of thinking as a product person or thinking as a product manager is that you're constantly questioning why products are built, um, whether it's a physical product or software, if you're scrolling through a music platform or a social media platform, um, or even an everyday um, platform that you have to log into for work, being able to constantly question why it's built that way and how you would redesign it can potentially lead you to your next business venture or your next business idea. Okay, so any questions on um, just the presentation? It could be about paradox, um, product development, common roles. Um, I uh, just yeah. to get some questions in the chat. Uh, awesome. So one is what are usual challenges for product managers? Do you have a unique challenge you faced? So there's two questions in there. So just to clarify that first question, is it what are common challenges that you face as a product manager? Uh, yes, I, that's the way it's phrased, but uh, Isa, certainly feel free to chime in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, I know that a lot of product managers, they really face the issue of wanting to, where you get kind of in between both the business and say the engineering team. So since you're the liaison between business engineering and the client, um, you could get pulled into so many different directions. You could be having um, your business and your strategy telling you to do or to, to build a product one way. Your clients are telling you to build it another way. And then your engineers are saying, absolutely not, we won't build it that way. You have to really learn how to communicate with all areas of the business and to almost be like that person that liaison, the, the middle ground to communicate with the business, with engineering and with your client to get to that key problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and I think that's why it's so important to break down that problem and to focus in on what problem am I solving, not necessarily what feature am I building. Um, that will really help you in, in some of those communication skills and that's something that I face every day, um, that a lot of people in product face every day is trying to bridge that gap between the business, um, the engineers and the client. Great, and then uh, do you have some unique challenge that you've had to face? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, one of the unique challenges, so especially in my role at Paradox, um, I'm very client facing. So in some product roles, you may not necessarily be that client facing. Um, you can be more behind the scenes with your engineering team. Um, and I think there's a, a benefit to being client facing as a product person. Um, you can understand the pains that your client's going through They'll tell you it on a call. Um, they're very upfront and straightforward with you. And it makes a product person really empathize with some of their pains to build really great products. Um, and so one of the challenges that I face a lot 
um, and, and pains that I face is, is trying to talk with a client and get them to really understand what problem they're trying to solve. Um, so if they say, hey, Jess, I wish this button was purple or I wish this button was blue, being able to really understand, well, why? Why do we want that button to be blue? Um, what is it doing? Is it, um, is it helping with conversion? Is it you know, really improving the candidate experience to apply to a job quickly? Um, and so kind of questioning your clients in a way to understand the problem that they want to solve versus just creating a feature that you know, makes them happy and makes them content for the next two weeks is so key and important. Um, but it's definitely a challenge that I face every day to, to constantly remind myself that I, I want to solve my client problems. I don't want to create a feature that just is like a, a tape or a Band-Aid over something that they will want to fix long term. Okay, great. So I'm just going to do a Thank time you. here. We're um, a bit over. So if it's okay with you, Jessica, can mm -hmm. you take two more questions and then we're going to have to uh, wrap it up? Yeah, of course. Okay, awesome. So, um, and you're getting thank yous by the, uh, by the masses here. So that's awesome <laughs> too. Um, so how do you, this is, how do you market the product and the company at the same time? We find it hard to talk about the product and tone down the holding company name. And then, then sort of a parallel question is, how does Olivia have its own brand without getting confused by the main brand? So they're yeah. associated question. Good question. Yeah, those are both really great questions. Um, so the first question there in terms of really being able to market your product, um, I think it's key that product and marketing teams work closely. So if you have a marketing team or if you don't have a marketing team, always going back to those user stories and making sure it's user centric will help you market that that product. So what problem are you trying to solve um, for the feature or for the product that you want to release? And how can you convey that into words that um, your target audience or that persona that you really want to meet um, to be able to understand and really want to purchase that product? Um, so it's something that's really key when, when working with marketing teams or if you're the CEO and you are the marketer and the product manager, um, just really thinking about the user in mind and putting that into words of how would you want a user to see your product and what's going to make them remember that as the product that they love. Um, in terms of how we differentiate Olivia um, with our own branding of Paradox, that's actually a really good question. Um, and how we go about that is that Paradox is the overall company and solution um, that we provide to our um, clients. Whereas Olivia is the assistant that helps their TA team, that helps the candidates um, with going through the entire talent acquisition process. So we really position Olivia as the overall assistant and the brains behind Paradox. Um, we also allow though our clients to change her name if they'd like to, um, just to fit with their persona and change her name, and change um, her image as well, just to make sure it really fits with their branding. So we also make that assistant as somebody that can fit perfectly into your organization um, based off of um, the name. If you want it to be, um, you know, something that isn't necessarily female versus male, uh, we give that openness and that opportunity for our clients. Awesome. And then the uh, next question from Lillian is how do you approach the elaboration of user stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think when thinking about user stories and, and kind of what I had highlighted is really being able to define your persona. So especially with the water bottle use case, um, you can either focus in on somebody that uh, is your everyday user, it's your young adult um, from 18 to 30 years old, or you can focus on the elderly. So somebody that may have different pains as a user, um, but understanding that persona will really allow you to dive deep into user stories. Um, one of the key things that I love to do as well in user stories is to, is to define the I need to have versus I would like to have. Um, the needs are, these are the most critical, this is what I need for this product to um, survive, and this is what I need for the product to actually sell, versus the nice to haves or the like to haves that are just nice additions or nice add-ons. Great. Um, thank you so much. So. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. So thanks everybody for joining. Lindy, you may get the, uh, she's coming, she's dialing in from South Africa. So I think she's, she gets the award for <laughs> the furthest away. 
and uh, we will be posting this recording with an associated blog on women in big data in approximately a week. And thank you so much, Jessica. This was really, really fascinating. And um, I personally am impressed with how far this field has evolved. So everyone, thanks again, take care and uh, come join us next Thursday for uh, the next entrepreneurial series. All right, thanks, everyone everybody. have a great day. Thanks.